This video is brought to you by that unshakable feeling that you have that the whole world is totally f Hey kid, are you tired of feeling hopeful for the future? Are you bored with working so you can pay your bills and save for retirement like some kind of beta loser? Well give up now! Thanks to decades of unchecked capitalism, climate denialism, intractable political structures, and a society that is collectively incapable of understanding the true consequences of its carbon-intensive actions, you don't have to worry about any of those things. What are you doing? Buying stocks on Robinhood so you can invest in your future? Get real! Spiral into a bottomless pit of hopeless dread instead! Abandon all pretense that your theoretical children will have a planet that has birds and bees and frogs and breathable air and all that namby-pamby bullshit. Only losers think like that. Give up hope now. It's what they want you to do. Climate dude, try it today. Climate doomers, gloomers, and anti-boomers, welcome to my channel, Compost Modernism. So, I spend way too much time thinking about climate change, ecology, permaculture, politics, white supremacy, masculinity, colonialism, fascism, etc. And how all these things are interrelated. So, I decided to start this YouTube channel. YouTube channel? So, I decided to start this YouTube channel to manifest these thoughts into something more than just air. On this channel, I'll be talking about the aforementioned topics and much more. But in order to set the tone for all this, I need to start in the dark and doomy depths of my existential dread. Climate doom. So, where to begin? The origins for how our species came to be uh, single-handedly murdering the biosphere are, well, fairly complicated. This is something I intend to get more into in a later video, so like and subscribe. But since nearly half of our total carbon emissions have occurred in the past 30 years, it seems appropriate to start with that fun little fantasy, that paradigmatic perversion that we like to call Neoliberal economics. Now, let's just take a moment to titillate our imaginations a little bit. Let's imagine that we live on this planet that hangs like the rarest of gems in the deathly void of space. And on that planet, we have what we might call a habitable biosphere. Over the course of millions and millions of years, through all of the most mysterious and miraculous interactions of elements, evolutions, and ecology, all sorts of strange creatures emerged. Among these creatures, were those that would eventually come to call themselves humans. At least that's what they were called in one of their many arbitrarily formed sets of sounds that they used to convey meaning, called English. It's complicated. Now, these creatures evolved language, and religion, and culture, and music, and art, and TikTok, and hentai, and monster jam, and all these other wild and crazy things. But somewhere along the way, through a series of different cultural machinations and collective deceit, that species began to convince itself that it was somehow separate from, and dare I say, superior to, the very biosphere that had given birth to it. Now, this idea took time to truly take hold, but once it met with just the right combination of greed, technology, and white resentment politics, it became a force so powerful that it threatened the very existence of the biosphere that it so depended on. After a couple of centuries of these ideas being tested out in various ways, there came a time known as the late 20th century, in which these ideas truly took their highest form. It was around this time that the idea that the biosphere existed specifically for the exploitation by a certain set of humans that possessed a large amount of these arbitrary points that we called money, often at the expense of the other humans that possessed fewer of these points. Again, it's complicated, but it was around this time that this idea truly took hold. Among these weird and perverse ideologies were a series of fancy sounding theories that were used to convince poorly informed people that these ideas would actually benefit them. Ideas like P-Omni-Daddy trichonomics 
and beneficial deregulation and neoliberalism. And that's where we find ourselves today, folks, quaking in the long shadow of these lies. Now, once one begins to accept the fundamental interconnectedness of all beings and your own role in the grand ecology of an earthbound existence, one begins to create a friction against that dominant myth of our age, that soul-sucking, neoliberal, market-based fantasy that we are all individually rugged, bootstraps-based economic units, and that your most important role in society is fulfilling your destiny as an extractive individual, that you yourself are a market-based product, completely independent of the circumstances or the conditions that produced you, a rational economic actor in a great game of supply and demand-based capital flows, and that your worth as a being is directly equal to either your ability to enrich someone else or to enrich yourself at the expense of others. It is this very thinking that has provided the pseudo-moralistic justification for those who, for far too long, have plundered the earth and earned trillions and trillions of dollars while doing it. In the words of two people who should never have been taken seriously, People constantly requesting government intervention are casting their problems at society. And you know, there's no such thing as society. The nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help. It's almost like, if you're a person that hates the idea of government, maybe you shouldn't be in charge of a government? Now, I don't wish to digress too deeply into parsing the ideological cluster that is neoliberalism, but it is obvious to me that the profound failure of neoliberalism is at the heart of both sides of the political debate right now. On the right, people sense that their communities are eroding away and their identities are being replaced by a desperate holiness, that they've been cheated, and that the senator, and that the senator, senators, not the senators, I mean, it's not wrong, that they've been cheated, and that the senator centers, mother that they've been cheated, and that the centers of their communities are being threatened by outside forces. Why do you think such people are so vulnerable to the boogeyman of the globalist? Such folks, quite frankly, aren't really wrong in their sense that their communities have been ruined by an outside force. The problem is, it's not the globalists sending Muslim refugees to drown their wholesome, Bible-thumping communities in Sharia law. Want to know who your real enemy is? Spoiler alert, it's not the immigrants. On the left, especially amongst those like myself, who see the environmental crisis as being at the heart of basically all socio-political and cultural issues, there's a similar sense, that sense of impotent rage that our political system is so deeply broken that we see hardly any realistic path forward on climate change. That sinking, sickening feeling that maybe bringing children into this world would be irresponsible because we aren't even sure that they'd have a, have a planet worth living on. The sense of resignation that maybe you'd all just be better if it burned down. The helplessness. And the news headlines that send us into a spiral of existential dread. The knowledge that, despite our deepest wishes, Best intentions and maybe even our actions could just all be in vain. The doom, that deep sense of doom that hauls you out and makes you feel like all is already lost. That any spark of hope shall surely be snuffed out by Mitch McConnell, the chronic incompetence of Democrats, Senate filibusters, and the circus of political idiots on the right who prefer to weave conspiracies about Jewish space lasers being the real reason for forest fires instead of ever actually having any sort of substantive discussion on the matter. The deafening chorus of bad faith, alt-light doofuses that hide beneath the veneer of rationality so that they can distract poorly informed minds by waving shiny culture war nonsense and producing fast-talking word vomit, proclaiming their intellectual superiority despite all evidence to the contrary, instead of ever actually engaging with the facts or discussing them with serious people. And beneath this context of hopelessness, there's that sinking feeling of complicity. That the way that our entire lives are structured is predicated on the carbon intensive industries that are slowly working towards their own undoing. That even you making certain food choices so that you can literally feed yourself is also you throwing your dollars at some of the most rapacious industries on the planet. The line of thinking goes something like, I don't want to make global warming worse, but I also want to continue living. 
but I also want future people in, to, in societies to have a habitable planet. But almost every aspect of my life depends on somehow making global warming worse. So, and that's what so many of us deal with. Something that is hung like a dark cloud over my consciousness for far too long. Like, I've dedicated my life to studying and communicating about climate change for years now, but I realized that in order for me to have done that, I often have to burn fossil fuels. You're watching this video right now, and chances are all the technologies that have gone into making that happen have made global warming worse. And it is these deep contradictions that compounds the sense of doom so much. Like, the Cold War generation had to worry about nuclear Armageddon, but at least the very nature of their lives didn't somehow increase the likelihood that that would happen. Such things were pretty much entirely out of their control. The difference between that and now is that nuclear war was a possibility. But at this point, climate change is a certainty. Though climate change's causes and solutions fundamentally are within our control, which is both a source of solace and deep dread. Wait, what's that noise? Oh. What is up tonight, my culture warrior brethren, my alpha male bros? All right, welcome to another mind-blowing episode of the Dumber with the Crummer podcast where we cover all the news that the lamestream media is too scared to talk about. All these lefty environmentalists want to talk about climate change like it's some kind of thing that we all need to be worried about. But like, this morning, like it was raining and, and now it's not raining. It, the, the, it, the climate changes, the climate changes all the time, guys. Just think about that. It's, it's not anything we need to be worried about or anything. Don't be mad at the oil tycoons who systematically denied climate change for decades and to this day create propaganda to make you doubt the science that they know is true, guys. I mean, who do you think is paying my dumb? They're just rational actors in the free market using their prerogative as profitable and virtuous individuals to make a few bucks, y'all. After all, free market neoliberal economics is literally a law of nature, dudes. And anything that might seek to alter or curtail it is actually satanic socialist propaganda. Seeking to drown our freedom and the constitution and welfare babies and drug addled pink hairs by making us feel bad on Twitter and forcing us to pay our taxes. Postmodernism is a Marxist lie designed to destroy truth and poison our fragile white minds with globalist propaganda. Don't forget to join the Dumber with Crummer Coffee Cup Club. Just send $500 to the Dumber with Crummer podcast and you'll receive a totally free Coffee Cup Club mug to show that you, my dude, never buy anybody else's bullshit. Next time on Dumber with the Crummer, we'll cover more stories that the lamestream media is too scared to talk about. Definitive proof that AOC's neo-Stalinist Green New Deal is behind the plot to cancel Dr. Seuss and our lord and savior, Donald J. Trump. This is the only podcast that runs exclusively on liberal tears, bro. Let's get ready to own them lips tonight with some f***ing news. the first version of the intro to this section, I was pretty tempted to just be completely dismissive of climate denialism. Like, the fact that I feel the need to even address it at all is, frankly, beyond absurd. I felt like continuing to address climate deniers and make it seem like they're anything but obviously in bad faith or willfully ignorant is just fossil fuel on their ignorant fire. And I basically felt like they should just be written out of the discourse entirely. But whether I like it or not, climate denialism is still very much a part of the puzzle in trying to figure out how to move America forward on climate change. Why? Because climate denialism was a con. For decades, billionaire petrocrats have injected just enough polarizing doubt 
and tribalistic nonsense into the discourse around climate change to basically bring us to the brink of destruction that we find ourselves peering into today. Before too long, likely within the next 10 to 15 years, all politics, whether it is presented as such or not, will be a climate issue. And like all cons, there eventually comes a day when the creditors come a-knocking. And what do you think these heinously well-funded grifters will do when the people that they fooled slowly begin to realize that they've been lied to? Will it be... <laughs> we just really got the science wrong on this one, guys. So, funny story. Turns out we aren't experts after all, and we were just, we were just holding the graphs upside down. <laughs> No f way. If the situation becomes bad enough that the average person begins to find that their life is adversely affected by climate change, more so than is already happening, do you think that suddenly and miraculously Fox News, PragerU, et al. will suddenly admit that they've been lying? Or will they, with all the rhetorical alacrity of an abusive boyfriend gaslighting his victim, Find ways to spin the situation into making you believe that the real reason that your life suddenly sucks is because of all these goddamn immigrants. My bad, baby. Sorry about all that lying about climate change and stuff. It's not my fault, though. It was all those immigrants. And that black music got my mind all mixed up. And viral lefties are basically a dime a dozen. But if we're truly serious about addressing climate change and environmental issues as the massively systemic challenges that they are, then we need to become zealots of coalition building with anyone on the right who isn't in full-blown denialism. Because that is kind of the one of the only ways of actually creating a future that is worth believing in. And I can't stress this enough, it has to be a future that focuses on racial equity and racial justice while also being a future that random-ass white-bred people from Iowa can see themselves as being a part of. What exactly do I mean by this? I'll be covering this topic more in a later video, so like and subscribe. I recognize that there are many folks for whom climate denialism is basically a core belief at this point, but we simply cannot afford to write them off as a lost cause because there's just too much at stake. Also, if you're someone that self-identifies as a rational skeptic, then denying or downplaying climate change and the generations of scientists that have been earnestly sounding the alarm on the issue is about as rational as claiming that systemic racism doesn't exist because there are no laws that say you should hate black people or whatever. Oh, wait. Wanna know what makes me so f rational, dude? I don't listen to the scientists. I'm no expert, but <laughs> I don't need no, no sissy scientist to tell me how rational I am. Climate change and thus climate solutions are the future. And to deny them is to resign yourself to being a passive passenger on the vehicle of history. Now, global warming, at least for those of us that don't live in the right-wing cinematic universe where transgender Antifa Mexicans are colluding with SJW ISIS communists to cuck the white race by casting black characters in the new Star Wars movies is pretty self-evidently the defining struggle of our generation. To those of us that are more or less climate woke or Green pill. The fact that we were born into an ailing world that is largely controlled by cartoonishly corrupt boomer skimbags who are far more concerned with keeping their own power than they ever have been with preserving the integrity of the biosphere that has given them literally everything that they've ever had is, well, as we've already discussed, was depressing. But this, like almost everything else that exists in the minds of these deeply imperfect creatures that we call humans, is a narrative. Narratives very often exist outside of the realms of reality. A narrative is, essentially, a story. It is not the thing itself. It is simply the manifestation of that thing, which has been fed into our bone-encased meat computer, which has a handy penchant for spinning what it thinks it knows into narratives. Now, why do I bring this up? Because climate change, and what we tell ourselves about it, is also a narrative. And the implications of that narrative that we create really matter. Now, perhaps what I mean by all this would be best illustrated in an example. Now, given what we know, not suspect, to be true about global warming, certain patterns are going to start to manifest. We are already beginning to see one such pattern rising in a steady crescendo. Mass immigration. 
both Europe and the U.S. have seen an uptick in immigration from countries where the earliest symptoms of climate change have exacerbated the situation in places that very often have not yet fully recovered from the brutal legacies of colonialism. As has already been made clear by centuries of racist political rhetoric and xenophobia, immigration is a very, very controversial issue that has the power to be weaponized to mass mobilize people to act out of fear of the other. Now, fast forward about 10 years in the future, when climate change has become that much more real and the discourse around it continues to be one of ecological disaster and doom and gloom. Imagine how such a well-meaning narrative can be very easily distorted into one that others and vilifies the poor, aka those who are least responsible for climate change. Then the next thing you know, all of y'all's moms are posting some bad shit bullshit on Facebook about how a caravan of immigrants are here to drink all of our white people water or whatever. In fact, such Malthusian nightmares are a time-honored tradition. It literally happens already. Climate change and a climate change future is very often represented as a gloomy and inevitable shitscape where everything will suck and we'll just have to get through it somehow. And maybe that will be the case. If we don't do it right, then that will be the case. Climate change at this point is inevitable. But the way that that future looks, and who benefits from it, is something that we can control. And we must be sure to do so carefully. Now, this is not to say that alarmist movements like Extinction Rebellion, Earth First, or Fridays for Future are wrong to spread their message. Because at this point in time, the world is so far behind on addressing climate change, we basically need all the help that we can get. But I do strongly believe that we on the environmental left need to be actively and intentionally cultivating the narratives around climate change's implications so that they don't run away from us or get hijacked by eco-fascists once it becomes politically convenient for them. Climate change solutions will require us to change many things about our lifestyles, yes. But if done correctly, climate change adaptation could make a world that is cleaner, greener, and more satisfying to live in. An effectively decarbonized world would provide jobs, a sense of community, greater racial equity, a societal sense of purpose, better air, cleaner water, and a populace that knows that its work is tangibly making the biosphere a better place to live in for all creatures. Can you imagine anything more satisfying? <laughs> Dominant ideas of environmentalism have long been gatekept by a white-centric aesthetic notion. Privilege to enjoy nature and appreciate the aesthetics of it does not make you an environmentalist inherently. If you are white, and if you care about the environment, then the toxic burden of white supremacy is your cross to bear. The battle for the future of this planet, especially in the US, is a battle against white supremacy. Doom and resignation to feelings of it is the easy way out. To lay down and die is always the easy way out, nor should we surrender to a lazy hedonism that tells us to consume with wild abandon because it's all f***ed anyways, as to do so is to act out of immense privilege and wanton disregard for your fellow human. We should be afraid of the consequences of our inaction, but we should not act solely on the basis of fear. For fear is the currency and the language of the fascist. But hope, hope is how we mobilize and inspire. The future that we want is entirely possible, and that future depends on the narrative that we create, the way that we imagine it, and the way that we manifest it. Here we are, standing on the precipice of the end of the age of neoliberalism. And that's really exciting. Trump lost the election, guys. We now have a real fighting chance at manifesting the world that we need. What do we have to lose? Everything. But what do we have to gain? Everything. But in order to do that, and to do it well, we must be honest about who our greatest enemy is in this fight.